Uh, happy weekend, um, everyone who is uh, watching. Uh, thank you for joining us. And um, today we are going to continue our conversation about Africa. And uh, I have here today, including myself, uh, four Africans who are very connected to uh, what happens in Africa daily. Uh, not only because we were all born and raised there, but because we feel that we have a responsibility to maintain that connection. Therefore, we not only maintain contact by telephone, but we believe that that's not enough. We also make sure that we read about what's going on there and make sure that we visit. And we are all very interested, as are many immigrants uh, from Africa, whether they live in Europe or in uh, the United States or anywhere in the world, uh, we are very interested in thinking about what the responsibilities of individuals and communities are to make sure that Africa is not, no longer what, um, what it is right now. Uh, but it's difficult to talk about change in Africa without knowing uh, what to change to, or what Africa used to be. Uh, in my private moments, uh, for example, I wonder how come uh, the, the great Africa that produced um, the Songhai, the Mali Empire, the uh, Ghana, uh, the Ashanti, produced the Benin Kingdom and all of that before the uh, colonialists came. How come that same Africa with all those great kings and um, all the powerful economies uh, really has degenerated to a continent which uh, we now think of as that place where uh, the leaders of the nations are people that are really intellectual pygmies? Today I have with me uh, to answer these questions and to talk about the way that uh, we can cause change to happen. I have. Uh, Dr. John O'Conn. You can just let everyone know just by raising your hand, uh, John. Uh, we have Dr. Yeah. John O'Conn, uh, who is here uh, in the United States. I have uh, Emmanuel uh, Bio, who is from Ghana. Uh, Dr. John O'Conn is from Nigeria. Emmanuel is from Ghana. He also lives here in the United States. And we have Mr. Pauline Young, uh, who is also from Nigeria and lives here in the United States. Uh, so, as I have said, uh, Africa was once a very thriving continent, even though Europeans at that time called it a dark continent. And then there was a lot of progress in Africa. Uh, we had a lot of statesmen, we had kings, and we had uh, a lot of progress on that continent. And now this, when we talk about Africa, uh, people think about other problems there notwithstanding how beautiful the natural resources are. But Emmanuel, this is where we are. How did we get here? Well, let me say this. Um, when you look at the great empires in Africa, and when you closely examine the political structure of those kingdoms uh, and how they operated, which, even though epitomizes progress and prosperity in those kingdoms, when you study the social structure and how the polity used to be, it has always been a system of oppression. Because when you look at the kings, the kings are elected by the council, the council of elders with no consultation uh, with the people. Um, so, anybody who became a king in Ghana, or for instance, the Ashanti, only wore the power if he was able to win the support of the Council of Elders, without really giving credence to the, the subjects. And that itself is not even sufficient to explain what we go through in Africa. When we, at the unit level, at the family unit level, there's a similar duplication of political structure where the father is the boss and has an unquestionable authority. So the children, the wife and the children, are literally held in subjugation. Uh, they are views on their head and they are not active participants in determining how the family has to run. The same thing is replicated in the government system. 
where the people themselves are completely removed from the political structure. So when it comes to prosperity and distribution of wealth, there hasn't been any equitable distribution of wealth in Africa. And as a result, and as a matter of fact, with our involvement in the colonial government, and as you can recall, they came to rule Africa through our kings without engaging any social reforms. So we are born and raised to be despondent. We are born and raised to be ineffectual in terms of affecting our own lives and the life of society because we're not able to challenge the authorities that are already in place. And there are no systems in place that enables the ordinary person to affect change in Africa. Okay, uh, let me stop you there, Emmanuel, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, Paul, let me just, you've heard Emmanuel. He has said that we are what our fathers were. We are no different from our fathers. And the question that I have is, uh, do you agree with that? Because it seems like the point that he's made is actually consistent with what we are seeing. Uh, because he did say, for example, that in, the, in those historical times that we are referring to, the people who held power held power because they had the support of a small group of people. And it didn't matter whether the rest of the people actually even uh, cared whether those people should be in power or not. What they thought did not matter. Therefore, oppression was sustained. And he makes that link between that and what we now have, what we still have today, where, for example, in Zimbabwe, you have a president who's been in power since 1980, and he's now about 90 years old, and he's not offering anything to the country, uh, where inflation is over a thousand percent. Now you have Malawi, where the Banda family has been in power since 1959. You have Togo, where the Ayadema family has been in power and doing nothing. And uh, you have Uganda, where Museveni has been in power now for almost 30 years. Uh, so that seems to support the point that Emmanuel is making. And I'm wondering if you have a different view, or if you just want to expand that. Well, the Emmanuel is largely all right in terms of the uh, social structure of our, our people and families. And, but there are other ex ex circumstances also that have, have con uh, colluded to create the, the environment that we have. Um, during the Shortly after the colonial days, there was a great rise in many Africans who came to power, and there were great debates about what, what, uh, how Africa should move towards. There was Marxism, there was democracy, there were different forms of uh, uh, rule rule that were discussed, but with the intervention of the outside forces. Right about the time of uh, Lumumba, Lumumba, the, the death of Patrice Lumumba, and other figures that came around, there were changes that came. So the, what happened in Africa and change in Africa was that 40 years ago, about just about 40 years ago, things started to change. There started to be a disinvestment in Africa. There wasn't there was a lack of investment in ec economically. There was a lack of investment politically. There was a lack of invest investment in human capital, and so there was this general mode of disinvestment that you know, that that occurred, you know, in, in people. Then there was uh, then then came in the advent of conflicts, the 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 need to take power in ways that you know. Well, it did not, on democratic ways, it yielded people like Mugabe, which you just mentioned, and it yielded a lot of military rule within Africa that now, in some places, deteriorated into actual conflicts, or civil wars, and, and so on. And so, based on all of that, there has been a gradual ero erosion of, uh, of our values and and the way we, the, the support systems that we have. Yes, Emmanuel is also right that, you know, we didn't have a good base anyway because of the, the authoritarian structures that we had. 
you know, but you know, it is part of, you know, part of it. What has made it worse now is because the, our, our crop of leaders have become more interested in personal goals and personal enrichment, and they have not invested in our people like they should. So, John, you heard what uh, Paul said. He talked about a lack of a lack of investment and uh, disinvestment. He talked about selfishness. He talked about conflict. And uh, for people like me, uh, who were born and raised in Nigeria, and I'm sure that um, Emmanuel can say the same thing about Ghana, and many Africans can say that. It appears that you can actually point to a time, just as Paul did, as to when that kind of uh, disinvestment stopped, and when the lack of interest in the people stopped, and when selfishness uh, kind of increased. Uh, and the people who suffer just seem to be the people who don't have the uh, who don't have the opportunities to know somebody in power. Uh, so my question to you is that, be seeing that that is the way it is, and Emmanuel has made a point that we are very much like our fathers. Should we not be better than our fathers, and should we not? be the people who should have known better than our fathers did and be investing in our people. And why isn't that happening? Well, uh, Dr. Hero, uh, th uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity. I wasn't here last week. So, Paul, it's a pleasure, as always. Emmanuel, very nice meeting you. Nice meeting you, sir. Um, again, um, to piggyback on what uh, Paul said, I think... Um, uh, to borrow from what we had, the uh, discussion we had two years ago, Dr. Hero, uh, we were talking about Africa, talking about Nigeria, our country, and, um, and we were talking about the youth. And you told me uh, that, uh, of a, a joke, that the people of the younger generation in Nigeria said that, uh, that they, they were born to hear that, that the youth are the future. Or the you know the children are the future, but the way things are going in Nigeria is either the uh, the elder they lie to us, or we are really not the future. And you know I say that to say this. Uh, I, I believe that we we can do better. Uh, I believe that we can do better, and um, we need to do better. I personally cry for our country because there's no other country that I, I have to, to call mine. Even though we are here in, in America on a, what I consider you know, voluntary uh, exile. But um, when you look back at the lack of investment, as Paul has mentioned, I was looking at the statistics. Uh, I don't know how old it is, but um, what has happened back in, in 19, 1975. Uh, uh, 1975, the original uh, GNP of Sub Sahara was 17.6. In 1999, it dropped to 10.5. And relative to world trend in Sub Sahara Africa, we have the health issues, mortality issues, adult literacy, uh, life expectancy uh, still staggering at 49 years old. 34% of the region are classified undernourished. Infant mortality rate uh, back maybe years ago was um, 107 per 1,000. Uh, 9% of 15 to uh, 49, ages for 15 to 49% are living with HIV AIDS. Uh, so uh, we've had last 20 years of bad policies, you know, poor governance uh, by the African elite. And my indictment is actually to people uh, of Africa, you know, people with um, higher degree of intellection because I think we can do better. I think that we have, we are very astute. I think that we have, uh, 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 for some of us that have been outside the country, we've seen the best practices and uh, our forefathers are uh, they were here before us, most of our African elite. But 
the investment, the lack of investment, lack of infrastructure, um, uh, has been one of the biggest problems. And as they say in 2015 in, in Nigeria, the investment of our people is based on, uh, they call it belly or stomach infrastructure. So, I think the stomach infrastructure has been, has, has been uh, uh, more of importance you know, to what happens to, uh, to everybody else. And, and uh, 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 people are suffering uh, because of the choices that we have made you know, to probably uh, uh, create kingdoms you know, for ourselves outside the country, uh, not building human capitals. Uh, not helping, uh, uh, educating uh, our, our people, uh, not uh, providing, uh, looking at the best practices as we've seen in advance, you know, advanced countries and taking that to the, uh, you know, to Africa. And I believe just like uh, uh, what I consider, you know, uh, Brother Emmanuel, Ghana uh, is a good symbol of democracy, you know, in Western, in South Africa, Africa right now. Uh, it is because the changes are actually uh, 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 from without, you know, not within. You know, we are the vanguard of change, which is why I like this, you know, this opportunity, this forum. We have more to offer, and I think um, um, we don't need to rely on the people within the country, you know, to orchestrate the change. Uh, we need to probably look at, you know, look at the things that we've seen outside. Um, uh, can we do better? Uh, actually, I have hope. You know, I know that we can. You know, I know things can change. Right. But I think me... we need to empower our youth. We need to uh, uh, help build proper infrastructure. We need to educate. Because I believe that education is a fulcrum for change. Right. Let me go to Emmanuel because I saw him nodding and uh, in agreement to what you were saying. Uh, but I think that you also said some things that I want him and then Paul to comment on. Uh, I was having a discussion with Emmanuel uh, recently, and he said that educated people have by and large failed Africa. And uh, I, I heard you, John, uh, saying that uh, people who had the education also really haven't lived up to expectation in some respects. And I think that both, uh, both points are consistent. Uh, and one of the things that uh, I, I think Emmanuel was referring to when he said that educated people have failed Africa is actually the, the idea that Africans have not very much, have not in ways that you would expect, we have not so much applied our education to the progress of Africa. That instead education has been for what you have just described as building kingdoms for ourselves outside the country. Uh, then I am thinking of the fact that we just talked about the kingdoms and the people who left those kingdom, who led those kingdoms, they were not, they didn't have Western education, but they led those kingdoms in some successful ways. And even people who led Africa in the 60s and 70s, many of them did. But if you look at Ghana today, and this is where I want you to come in, my uh, You know, I was in Ghana several months ago, and I was actually surprised at the stagnancy of development. And uh, it was hard to consider the fact that just in 2007, oil was found, when oil was found there, there was hope that that combined with democracy, Ghana was going to be the thriving example of success in Africa. And what we have now is that just in the last few months, uh, Ghana is in discussion with the IMF. Unemployment rate uh, is over the road. Inflation is really climbing. So, Emmanuel, just from that point, I want you to tell us, what has education done and what have the people with education done? Are they doing what uh, John is saying that education ought to be doing? Are we applying our education to our continent in the ways that we should be doing? And if the answer is no, what would Africa be like if we actually did apply our education? Well, I mean, maybe we have to probably define education. Um, if education is just going through universities and learning theories and so on and so forth without real-time application of knowledge, then maybe we have a lot of educated Africans or educated Ghanaians. Um, and also, I think 
it has to be our app. The purpose of higher education or the functionality of education probably can be viewed or understood by looking at the context of how the formal educational system started. You know, when you look at uh, the missionaries when they came, education was part, was an appendage to colonialism. And, and when you and I grew up only reading books that were foreign in content, which oriented us to Western, Western style, lifestyle. People who go, who look at our universities in Ghana, they are located in suburban areas, well built, high level class living, compared to the local people. So people graduate or go to these universities as a way of them becoming like the colonial masters that is having power and authority to rule over the people. And again, even when you look at the structure of our universities and due processes in our universities, you can see the same replication of oppression. You know, there are no means, for instance, in Ghana, if I have beef with my professor, there is no process of re review process. For me to go to my faculty or the, the dean of students to say, this is what I feel is going on now, and I need to have my case reviewed. Those things are not, even if they are there, they are just there in name, but in practice, it's still, let me put it this way, there's still a duplication of a vertical relationship at every level in our society, including our educational system. And people who go through our educational system are willing and ready to go with the system, hoping that they will graduate and come and locate themselves in society in the privileged positions. Not with the intent to really see education as a means to affect the overall social structure. And again, allude to what Dr. Dr. said earlier: on. stomach education, self and the family, immediate family. But they don't look at the constellation of people within that society. That All right. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, it's Paul. Yes. Yes. Um, if Emmanuel, if Emmanuel is right, and I don't think that um, I don't think that uh, most of us will argue very much with that. If Emmanuel is right, and the education that um, we get in, in Africa is such that it still places us above the rest of society, instead of making us part of that society and teaching us what we need to contribute uh, to the society. If that is right, then where is our hope? You, you see, uh, he, he, he quickly reminded me of a story of um, one of the governors of our, our great state. Uh, early, shortly after the Civil War, had a valedictory service for uh, the, his, his then deputy. And he stood in the podium and said, thank you for your theoretical approach to practical problems. <laughs> and everybody clapped. Nobody understood the meaning of the statement. Because the, the deputy was a professor in the university. And it, it tells you exactly what it happened. The kind of education that I earned in Nigeria was very good. But when I came to America, my first challenge was to translate the theory into practice. And that was the, that was the struggle for me. And also, but you, you see, it, it lends itself, the, that kind of education lends itself to what Emmanuel was saying. You know, we have invested, but we invested in the public sector and not really educational, educationally. We invested in the public sector in terms of producing politicians, poli producing civil servants and all that. So you have bloated this, this bloated uh, civil service that serves itself that most 80% of the finances of the country is used to service this public service. Now, there is something called uh, distributive pr pressure on the government at this time, on the governments in the country at this time, you know. There are two kinds of distributive pressure that uh, they face. One is that from the established people, the people we call the elites, who are there, who already feel like they are being encroached upon. Then there is the second pressure is from the people who enter government, who have already been uh, used to being being uh, uh, subjugated on. 
take, taken for granted, not treated properly. Now, when you have those two pressures that uh, from bear, bear, bear together, it creates this element of, um, for lack of a, a better word, is an aberration of what uh, democracy should be. Because you have people who never had, that are now in position of power, who get the power, and now use that power in an inordinate way. They don't know how to use it. The finances, they don't know how to use it. They build houses, they buy big cars, they marry second wives and third wives, and they do nothing to invest back in the people, which is what we are talking about, which we are trying to get people to go back to, to try to... The only way change can be driven is now. My daddy used to say that when when the, the warrior, the warrior cannot complain about the lion when he came to town to eat the goat. Where was he? Because when the lion comes, it eats his goat, eats the other people's goat, and if you are lucky, it eats the people too. Where were you when that was happening? That means that, you know, the good people and the people who are really in, intelligent and can handle these issues choose to stay away from it. And so they are not involved. The same thing happened with some of us who came abroad. We got comfortable. We got comfortable. That's the truth. And we had a, we have a hard time going back to serve. And so it is, it is, it, now we have to look at each, everybody has to look at themselves and see what they are willing to give to raise up, to bring about the change that we need in society. Uh, Emmanuel, uh, Paul is saying that we are all complicit and we are, each of us has a responsibility. Uh, to cause change to happen. I, I saw you not in agreement, and uh, my question is, what do you think that we can do? Uh, we leave fire away from them, and uh, what little steps can each of us take? Well, I think that, to be honest with you, it's, we need to change our values and our priorities as, as people. And, and again, it's not easy because I know a number of Ghanaians who have left the comfort of America, Canada, to go back to Ghana to help with the systems and, you know, who have just returned because of how entrenched corruption and a rotten system is. So for me, I believe strongly that, and in fact, that's one of my greatest motivation of even pursuing the PhD. I was hoping that I, I could go back to Ghana, take a faculty position, and have what we call a plenarian core. The middle class prof uh, university professors, the teachers, the middle class people who have some understanding or some level of social consciousness to begin to network with these people and also teach our students how or teach them by way of empowering them to ask questions, question the integrity of their professors, question the integrity of the government system, and hoping that that will transcend downwards in the various the training colleges where teachers will be oriented and engage in some type of social reforms, whereby educationally the content of the education that they impact to the children will also involve some level of empowerment for the children in high schools to be able to question authority. And I think that if we are able to begin to question these things and we begin to realize the weakness of our social institutions, that will be the beginning stage for us to begin to think about institutions that can create social justice. And once we are empowered enough to do those things, then there will, there will be real hope for us right. to move forward. Sure. Emmanuel, you have presented a map, uh, you know, a real process of change. Um, following what Paul said. And so I come to you, John. Uh, what they have both said is actually quite remarkable. Uh, it speaks to uh, people who believe that there are possibilities. And if we believe that there are possibilities, then change can actually happen. Uh, my question to you then is, how can you do what they are suggesting uh, in a society like we have in Africa, it doesn't matter what uh, country uh, you can name it, but in nearly every African country, it is actually very difficult to make change happen. 
They want to begin the process without being stymied by some powerful interest. So how can you do it? Yeah, uh, I think um, the uh, change um, we are seeing a whirlwind of, a whirlwind of change and uh, as we speak in Africa, despite the uh, all that is happening, and I happen to be a, a glass half full kind of guy, not a glass half empty. Uh, President Obama once said that education is no longer a pathway to success, that it is a prerequisite. And I think the education that we need is basically raising the consciousness of our people you know, to best practices, which we have been part of, you know, part of in the, in the Western world. Um, where, where do you begin? Uh, we happen to be in the age that we have a plethora of communication with, you know, uh, gadgets, you know, devices, uh, social media, and um, social media, print, traditional, and all that. And, 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 all that. Um, and we also have seen some of the things right now, things happen like the uh, what we're doing right now. People can see it in real time in a few hours. We have to begin to educate our people on some of the tools, you know, that matters. Of course, the consciousness of our people have to change. Those those that are the, the stakeholders, uh, the educators, uh, as Emmanuel said, uh, but it starts with uh, positioning, because remember. Uh, uh, when we talk about communicating change, communication is the process of, of exciting a meaning in the mind of somebody else through verbal or non verbal means. Basically, if you don't excite a meaning in the mind of someone, you have not communicated. So we begin, have to begin the process of, of exciting a meaning in the mind of some of our people. And I think it takes people like us who are very passionate about our country, passionate about change, you know, to be uh, the beacon or the vanguard of, of that change. I, I, I told um, a group of people that I spoke uh, to in West Virginia over the last weekend that my education wasn't so much, you know, for, uh, for the mainstream America. And we acquired knowledge that we can go back home and effect uh, uh, changes, okay? And in the word of Martin Luther King, he said, if not me, who? If not now, when? You know, um, I think we all, it takes, it, does, it, doesn't, um, it, it doesn't take a whole lot of people. It takes very few good men, very few educators, because uh, somebody once said that uh, accused all of us. He said, all of you uh, Africans in America with PhD, you guys are just, you know, you're not part of the problem. What are you doing? But I think um, it's really not about everybody doing, you know, doing. Uh, okay, I think we're having a little bit of difficulty with. Um, based on the passion. Okay, uh, Paul, I will go to you very quickly, and based I, on the interest, and based on. The, uh, yeah. Paul, yes. I will I'll go to you and I will ask you, is there hope for Africa? Yes, there is hope for Africa. Africa is the only Africa is the only continent that rejects people from the diaspora. We need to go back and begin to engage our people. At the at the at the local level, at every level, and to begin to assist in the process of change. John brought up very, 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 very strong points in terms of, in terms of how we communicate and how we begin to change people and begin to be part of their process. And it really is not going to take a, a we, we are waiting for a think tank to, <laughs> from somewhere or some savior from somewhere to help us, then it won't be possible. We have to be part of that, that change. And we have to, find ways, use all forms of media. This is one way of uh, effecting change, and I'm glad we are doing this, and we need to continue these discussions. Because there's, there are things that are around the pike that we need to really get our people involved in. 
and to understand that there needs to be a, a fundamental change and a, a fundamental investment in our people. If we don't do that, if we don't invest in our people and trust the fact that, that we have that ability to do that, then we cannot make that change. But there is hope. There is hope. We have to begin that discussion and we have to find opportunities to have that discussion at every level. We have to, in government, in, in conferences, wherever we need to go, we need to go with that message. Because Africans are going to have to change what is happening in Africa. It will not take anybody else to change it. It is going to have to be Africans. The colonial people have given us what we need and we, are, we should take charge of what 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 what, uh, what belongs to us and begin to make the appropriate changes, but we have to be participants. We have to be participants. Uh, John, uh, do you have any final comments? Uh, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, I uh, like the uh, this American uh, military slogan uh, it says uh, it takes uh, very a few good men. Um, I believe that uh, we are endowed differently, even in this uh, forum. What Emmanuel can do, I cannot do. What Dr. Hura can do, I cannot do. What Sir Paul can do, I cannot do. We are all endowed differently. I think the, uh, the, 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 the success of driving the change that we need is in being able to leverage our intellection. Okay? Because once we leverage our intellection, um, uh, the, you know, we are more, and we, we, we can do more. Um, so I think we have to leverage our intellection. If we leverage our intellection uh, from every sector, then there they, 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 they might be a sustained growth you know, in, in our country, in our region. Because just like you said, Dr. Hero, when we talk about successes, African success story, you know, I looked up, I looked up uh, uh, some research, you know, last night about the uh, sub-Saharan African success stories from 1960 to 1996. And, and what they consider success stories or sustained growth has to do with a consistent growth over 10 years, you know, to be categorized as, you know, uh, 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 as a, a continent, of, um, a region that has... Um, uh, uh, sustained growth. If you look at um, a, a start of the growth, for example, uh, from 1960 to 1964, you take um, Ethiopia, South Africa, Togo, it was 1970 to 1974. Um, that was when, that was just when you had that sustained growth. After that, there's no, you know, no growth. Um, look at uh, um, Cote d'Ivoire, Malawi, Namibia, and Tanzania uh, from 1975 to 1979. So the, all this is, this is very endemic. But you know, uh, endemic, and I can go on and on and on. There isn't a sustained growth, you know, in, 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 our, in our country for various reasons. Okay, going back to bad policies, you know, uh, you know, poor governance. But I believe, I believe that, um, again, I believe that there's hope. I believe that um, when we leverage our intellection and teach our, our brothers, uh, uh, over there about best policies, you know, uh, social responsibilities, and let them see, you know, what, what is happening, because if you do not do that, the society, uh, their children, uh, the whole, uh, uh, the, uh, the culture is going to be extinct. You know, our ch children are supposedly uh, uh, the future leaders, and it is incumbent upon us to be able to do that. So I believe that um, uh, uh, education is the key and to leveraging our intellection, uh, our strength, our potential, drawing people from different areas, that, uh, that is the key. Right. I like the fact that despite all of the crisis, you know, that um, that is really part of the African story, uh, every one of you still thinks there is hope. Uh, I think of Nigeria and I think of how great it was and all of the great things that you know, Nigeria was known for. And um, Nigeria remains a really um, very strong, very powerful economically uh, country. But it's also a country where you have a PhD president that inherited 
uh, very, very strong reserves and billions of dollars. And Nigeria is now, you know, just presently had to devalue its currency, and it's now in tatters. So it is one of the – all of that relates to the discussion that we have had today. And um, I do very much like the idea that there is hope, you know, the fact that we need to change our values and change our mentality and change the discussions that we have. And perhaps we can all together be part of that discussion and begin the process that we need, you know, which means that uh, it, it, might, it may actually be a good idea for us uh, four to travel again travel Nigeria, travel some of those African countries and just have some discussion forums. Uh, like you, I have hope because I know that uh, I look at Botswana, which has really attained uh, great successes. I look at Rwanda that has turned around and is doing very well. So I am sure that this can be replicated across Africa. Uh, Emmanuel, your final comments, please. Well said. Um, I still have hope. Um, but, you know, we're going to face a lot of resistance until people begin to see some tangible results of whatever our discourse uh, seems to portray. Um, I think in, a, in an attempt to, because I've spoken to a friend of mine who is a college professor at the University of Cape Coast, and I was talking about social change, social reform, social institutions, and they say, oh, you people live in America, you have all these esoteric ideas, you think it's going to work here? I said, my God, you teach at that level, and you have this you know, mentality is very unfortunate. But I think that when you really look at corruption and, and what really drives corruption in Africa, is that is the fact that people have a sense of insecurity when they get old. So if we're able to at least begin a system where people can have some security when they when they retire, I think it will help. So let me say something about it. simple things that we can do as people without costing the government money. Real estate, for instance, real estate investment can really deal with some of our health issues in Africa. If we, be, we are able to provide great housing to people, we can reduce uh, incidence of diseases by 50%, like malaria and all those things. Two, if we have a system where people can buy houses at a cheap cost while they are active people, knowing that when they retire they will have a place to live, they would really cut back on some of the negative activities that they're engaged in exploitations of positions. So I'm just saying that, why can't we, in this forum, this forum is great, and I think that we should begin to problem solve some of the issues that are confronting our people in Africa. I mean, let's begin with the middle class people and say, listen, we can suggest some economic or physical policies that the government can institute that can guarantee you a place to live when you retire, for instance. You know, so we need to look at some of the tangible, some of the problems and come up with tangible solutions that we can disseminate through some discussion and through the internet. For the people to know that, yes, there are a group of people in Africans in, in, in the United States who have practical ideas. I'm just saying that we can create an environment or, uh, whereby our Discussions. You talked about having public discussion and so on and so forth. Will lie, will fall on the fatal grounds because they already know who we are and what we can do to affect their lives. Thank you, uh, Paul. Your final comments. Well, thank you very much, I, I'm, and I'm glad you brought uh, uh, Emmanuel. You brought the tangible, practical aspects of it, this the, the, the bottom line to this. But I also want to insert the fact that we need to look at this, the psychological and social uh, thinking of our people and assist our people in reevaluating how they think and what they, what they think and what they accept and what they will not accept, you know. And also uh, empower them enough to be able to stand up and say, this is how we want it to happen. Because our people, for the most part, are like the gentleman from Venezuela said uh, that Dr. Hero pointed out to me, said some of them are tired. They are tired and they can't advocate for themselves. But we need to teach them how to do the, those things. We need to uh, teach them how to advocate even when you are tired. And also to be part of that movement to help empower them to be able to speak up and ask for what they need from the people who actually serve them, because they are not being served 
properly. And they need to be able to get that. Now, we can't talk down at them. And so we have to join them in some way. Find a way to join them in some way. Because if we talk down to them, that's all they will be remember. Oh, you guys come and talk and leave. But you don't offer, uh, you don't, uh, you don't sign up to be part of it. So we need to be part of it some way. But that also means that they be open to including us in this process. And so th this is the beginning. But Dr. Hero, I want to say that, you know, th this is encouraging to me, very, very encouraging to me. And one of the things that when we talk about development, and I was listening to John's numbers, and as I said, I said, to, do you all know that the millennium development goal mm -hmm. of one dollar per day is what we are talking about in terms of development? <laughs> one dollar per day. Wow. And based on that, we can say that some some countries can say that they've made progress. Wow, isn't that, isn't that something? Yes, uh, yes. You know, let me just say very quickly that that comment, I know she's going to be watching this, um, you know, that comment uh, that I passed to you this morning uh, was from a woman from Venezuela, <laughs> uh, not a gentleman. I'm sorry. Yes, she was responding to our last forum. You know, and, uh, and to something that you wrote, actually, that I posted on my blog. You know, the Lament for Nigeria that you posted on my blog. She was responding to that and sent this very touching a message that I passed on to Paul. You know, but I want to thank you all. Uh, this is a discussion that we are going to continue to have. It needs, it's a discussion that needs to continue to happen. You know, I don't get to see you guys, but uh, Emmanuel and I uh, get to see one another. It's been a while, but uh, I'll see him um, next, week. next week. Yes, <laughs> so, and we'll begin. You know, we'll continue to have these conversations, and thank God for technology. Uh, we'll continue to do this, and hopefully, we can cause the change that we need to happen. Uh, have a great day. I don't know what the weather is doing up here, you guys, are, but. Uh, and we have we're in the middle of a snowstorm down here. We are we are and, <laughs> we are anticipating one shortly. So so right. So it's, so have it it's, it's raining. Uh, it's a freezing rain. Right. I'm going, about, I'm going back to uh, Paul for some asapele uh, weather. <laughs> <laughs> so why you know you see that's one of the problems. Why don't we just travel to Africa to bring some warmth? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, yes. So ha have a we beautiful need to, weekend. We need to plan for that. We need indeed, to indeed. <laughs> have a beautiful weekend, John. Okay, you can take care. Thanks, guys. You have been tremendous. Thank you. Thank you. Nice and hopefully, you ho hopefully you all will get to meet uh, we, one of these. We days. need to begin the clarion call, man. We need to start here and enlarge okay. our territory. And, and Absolutely. Have the conversation to include a lot of people. Sure. And I am serious about what I said. You guys know that I traveled to them. I, you know, and I traveled to Nigeria. I saw Paul and John. You know, I know Paul and John also travel to Nigeria. I do things around the world, and uh, I, I am serious about that. That uh, we should plan discussion forums in Africa. Yes. Uh, and we should continue. We should discuss that and maybe uh, get it going. Okay. If we agree that we all have the responsibility. Yes. Sure. I have a beautiful weekend. You too. Thank you. <laughs> Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody. Okay, thank you. God bless you. Bye-bye.